All right, welcome back to the African History Network show. I have on the line one of the founders of one of the most influential and legendary hip-hop groups uh, ever, uh, Public Enemy. We have once again back on the African History Network show, the Minister of Information, the brother who's going to be here in Detroit September 8th at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe dealing with the death of the hip-hop Illuminati, the ascension of the ancient art forms, the author of The Psychological Covert War on Hip-Hop, the one and only Professor Chris. Hotel, brother, how you doing tonight? How you feel good, brother? You all right? Yeah, I'm all right, man. I'm all right. So we're looking forward right. to uh, looking forward to you coming to Detroit, brother. Wherever I go, man. I was up in Annie today, man. People were saying, "Did you know Professor Grip is coming?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he's gonna be on my show tonight. Oh, yeah. We keep that energy up. That's a beautiful thing. Exactly, exactly. So let, let's do this because, you know, we have uh, new listeners tonight. We have people across the country and outside of the country listening. And uh, some people who, you know, we have people of all ages that listen. So some people who listen, you know, to the show are maybe 18, 19 years old. So they may not have, you know, been listening to uh, Public Enemy in, say, 1990, 1991. So just tell people briefly uh, who you are and, and what's the significance of public enemy, and then we'll get into your upcoming lecture uh, September eighth in Detroit. Oh, okay. I am. Um, I am my father's son, and I'm my mm-hmm. son's father. But I mm-hmm. think more, more uh, critical than that in reference to raising the conscious level of our people. I'm just mm-hmm. your brother, but nonetheless, a researcher and an author, um, mainly not by my choice. A lecturer, definitely not by my choice. Um, a okay. brother that's putting, okay. disseminating, disseminating information to young people to raise the conscious level of our people, not by my choice. I tell people all the time that the music industry chose me, and I'm glad it did, simply because I definitely had something to say, but was in search of a medium to say it through. Okay. Here comes, here comes my childhood friend Chuck D. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he came and talked about this idea that, and kept telling me that. Uh, Def Jam and some people at Def Jam looking to sign him, but he don't want to do the Chuck D show. <laughs> okay. So he always knew okay. that I was organizing. He already knew I had an army. He already knew these things about me. So when we joined forces along with Hank Shockley, Keith Shockley, Eric Sadler, which is the bomb squad, I brought mm-hmm. the brothers that I've always soldiered with, and we called them the S1Ws. Then when I went right. out to find Terminator X, it was originally Keith Shockley, and then uh, some couple of things went down, and we ended up finding... Norman Rogers, who people know as Terminator X, and that formed the group um, Public Enemy. And the significant thing about Public Enemy setting itself aside from just being a normal, regular old hip-hop group um, was the fact that we decided to raise the conscience level of our people by any, every, and all means necessary. Exactly, exactly, brother. And I, I remember, man, being in college and, and listening to Public Enemy. I remember, you know, you all had Sister Soldier with you also. <laughs> Which was which was really good because we saw, you know, the feminine principle represented. And you know, at first, right. you know, at first when I saw Public Enemy, you know, man, I was like, you know, why, why is this military sister always yelling? But then when I actually right. took time to, to listen, you know, to what she was saying, and then when I, you know, when I started gaining consciousness, and you know, I saw the, you know, Malcolm Malcolm X movie in '92, read all about the film Malcolm X, and then I started mm-hmm. reading about Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, things like that. I was like, whoa! I said, this sister is really powerful, man. The public Enemy is really powerful, but, but it, it, I know you all had, you know, significant effect on us um, in Detroit at Wayne State University, where I graduated from. Uh, right. Groups like you, the X Clan, things like that, brother. So uh, it, you know, it was very powerful, and it caused us to think beyond our neighborhood or think beyond our city to right. look and see what's going on around the country, and then also tie that into a global perspective as well. Okay, so right, right, right. That's, that, that's very powerful. And today, a lot of you know, a lot of a lot of our, our youth, unfortunately, can't see past you know, their neighborhood or can't see past their city. So that's... Yeah, I think, uh, their, sight, I think mm-hmm. their sight has been blurred simply because those of us that were held responsible for cleaning the lens that they viewed reality through mm-hmm. did not do our job adequately enough. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, re- re- repeat that again. 
those of us that was responsible for mm-hmm. cleaning the lens that young people viewed reality through. Yes. When we didn't clean the lens to the degree where we seen this day coming, then mm-hmm. it posed a problem at the same time, um, at the same time the powers that be neutralized conscious hip hop and it posed a very severe problem simply because that consciousness was no longer there to check the evils that were going on in hip hop. Yeah. As Dell Jones teaches us in his book, The Culture Bandits. Mm-hmm. Yep, you're right about that. So even right. yeah. even though even though you had a group like two live crew on the scene, nonetheless you had positive groups, brand newbie and KRS one and other brothers exactly. and sisters on the scene that neutralized that kind of thing and, and there was checks and balances. Now mm-hmm. there's no checks and balances. Everybody right. wanna be Jay Z, everybody wanna be Rick Ross, everybody mm-hmm. wanna be Beyonce, everybody wanna be Nicki Minaj. And it's the mm-hmm. same vibration. And back in the day, we took pride in being different. Now they exactly. take pride in being just the same. Exactly. Uh, 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 conforming uh, to that to that mold. You know, because back back then, brother, and we're going to get into your lecture coming up uh, this uh, next Saturday. But, but 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 see, back then, one of the things you know, I talked to because uh, I interview a lot of the scholars on the show. So uh, one time when I was interviewing Renoko Rashidi, who I know you're familiar with, um, he was saying that we have to make being conscious popular again. And one of the key things back at that time, late 80s, early 90s, because of hip-hop and because of music videos, things like that, co- being conscious was popular. You know, a lot of, right, your, hip-hop, a lot of your hip-hop uh, videos, they took place on college campuses. So we got to see college, you know, in the music, in the hip-hop music. And then you right. also had a different world on, which helped to raise our conscious level also, okay? But... Okay. It, it, but it became cool to be conscious. So today is cool to be ignorant. It's cool to be dumb. It's cool to talk like Lil Wayne. You, half the time you can't understand what he's saying. Okay. So, so we, yeah. Go ahead, brother. No, 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 no. Go on. I'm listening. Okay. Yeah. So we have to have that. Uh, you know, if you read the book Brainwashed by uh, Tom Burrell. Okay. And I use that as one of my sources in my presentation, the uh, media's deliberate destruction of the African-American family. He talks about the uh, black inferiority campaign that's been waged for about uh, 400 years. And uh, um, uh, so we, now we have to wage a conscious campaign to popularize consciousness as opposed to popularizing inferiority and stupidity. You know, that's basically what has to happen. Uh, let's do this. I think I'm getting some feedback. Uh, it sounds like I'm getting some feedback from you. Uh, let me uh, let me try that's, something that's, here. That's some people hard at work, man. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Hold on. Just, just it happens all try. day, every day. <laughs> yeah, just, just a second. Hold on, brother. Hold on. All right. We're experiencing a little technical difficulties. We're going to try something here. Okay, let me try to get into that. Okay, you still there? I'm still okay. here. Okay. Um, you, right, are this. you still getting uh, the I'm, feedback? Yeah, I'm getting the feedback. Yeah. Do this. Can you can you, you hang up the call right back? You want me to call you from another number? Yeah, you could do. Yeah, if you want to do that also, that's fine. Yeah, just Hold just on, hang wait. up and call right I'm back call, in. I'm same call number. Right back from another number. Okay, brother. Okay, no problem. We'll, okay. we'll be here. Okay. All right, family's gonna try to get to a. Uh, uh, a line where we don't have that distortion. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. He'll be back with us in just a minute. Uh, Professor Griff from the legendary hip hop group Public Enemy. Uh, in the meantime, I'm following the information that I posted about the NAACP. Uh, the first chairman of the NAACP was the European attorney named Morfield Story. The second chairman of the NAACP was a European American Jewish man named Joel Spengar, J O E L, who turned out to be a spy for the military intelligence division. He turned over 32,000 names of NAACP uh, members to the military. He was chairman for a number of years, and when he retired, he was replaced by, uh, uh, as chairman, his brother, Arthur Spengarn. They didn't have an African-American as chairman until about 1976. Check out the book Betrayal by any other name by Dr. Khalid Al-Mansour, A-L-M-A-N-S-O-U-R. Dr. Khalid Al-Mansour, pages 317 to 340, fantastic book. I have it. 
I read it uh, back in the early 90s, and he came to Wayne State to do a lecture also. He deals, he deals with the history of the, the – the, the, that's just one of the things he deals with in there, the history of the NAACP. Okay, let's uh, – I think this is Griff again. Let's try to get him back on. Okay. Uh, okay, Griff, is that you? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, that sounds clear. Okay, good, good. All right, so um, – yeah, we were talking about the consciousness in the early 90s and, and, and how we see the difference in the marketing of uh, really ignorance uh, today in, uh, when we come to hip-hop. Now, coming up September 8th, Saturday, September 8th, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located at 12511 Woodward Avenue in Highland Park, four blocks south of the Davidson Freeway between Glendale and Highland Street. You're going to do a presentation, and I've seen your presentations before. I know Minister Malik Chabaz has brought you before, but this is a different one here. The Death of the Hip-Hop Illuminati, the Ascension of the Ancient Art Forms. Okay, so right, right. Away, right away, you already had the attention of a lot of people. Because before you called in, we just had a sister who called in asking about, you know, am I going to do a presentation dealing with the history of the Illuminati? So tell us, what are you going to discuss in, the, in this presentation? Well, in a nutshell, to give you bullet points, I'm going to deal with the, the Illuminati, who and exactly who the Illuminati is, what is, what the overall goal and purpose of the Illuminati, and then why is it that we're finding um, the signs and symbols of the Illuminati and other secret societies in hip-hop and in popular entertainment and popular culture. We have to deal with that simply because there would be no need to even mention the Illuminati if it wasn't affecting our everyday life. We're going to deal with Correct. racism and how it affects hip-hop and then some of the end results. We're going to deal with vibrations and frequencies. We have to go into some metaphysics in order to get to people to understand um, the psychic war that's being waged against us without us even knowing. Talk about silent sound and, and, um, and different and sounds and different weapons, acoustic weapons that they're using to attack our energy centers. So we have mm. to uncover who these Illuminati. So we have to cover some, uh, go over who are the agents of the Illuminati that are operating inside of hip-hop, uh, i.e. Puffy, Jay-Z, and a few other people. We have to uh, uncover and lay out the agenda on how to combat this stuff as, as, as being solution-oriented. We, okay. we have to go over these things. And um, it, it, it's very critical that we talk about these things, even right up to date, even right up to today, when we, when we look at the, uh, the Republican National Convention on TV, I believe it's on TV right now, the language yep. that they're using. Let's talk, let's talk mm -hmm. about the, the, um, the, uh, the crime bill and, and some of the things that the president uh, is putting in place that's going to affect young people at a, at a latter date. You understand what I'm saying? We have to, t we have mm -hmm. to talk about the culture banners that came in and just commandeered and took over hip-hop. Right, we right, have to talk exactly. about how hip-hop is a, a multi-billion dollar industry, but you don't see black people making the billions of dollars. Correct, correct. The corporate we conglomerates need to talk came about, in and took it over. Me? <laughs> the corporate exactly. conglomerates came in and took it over. Yep, go ahead, brother. Right, we need to talk about the corporate control of the media, of the news, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. it affects us. We have to talk mm -hmm. about um, all of the black talent, but the white wealth. <laughs> right, right. Right, so there's exactly. quite a bit of things that, that we have to that we have to cover, and um, hopefully we'll have enough time um, to cover it all and, and lay it out the way it should be the way it should be laid out. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, right. excellent. Now, now also you're going to talk about resurrecting the modern day Osiris or Asar, as as, as the ancient Kemetic people called them, awakening the art forms that lie within us. Now, now, now tell us tell us about that. What we're going to do, we're going to, have to go back and reawaken and re, uh, reascend those particular uh, ancient art forms that we used to use in, for mm -hmm. celebrations, for festivals, for rituals, and this kind of thing. These were the things that kept us alive as a people, always having our culture intact. In, in so a lot mm -hmm. of times if the people don't know them and they're not familiar with them, we can't exercise them and extract the energy and the power that our ancestors extracted from them. So we need to mm. we need this reascension of the ancient art form, but we have to know what the ancient art forms are. Right. So we're going right. to discuss that, and we're going to connect it right to ancient Kemet. We're going to connect it to the Dogon. We're going to connect it to various different tribes in various different places on the continent. Mm 